to Mindscapes, our series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy define our contemporary world. My guest today was described as by President Clinton as India's gift to America. He describes himself as a spiritual vagabond. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Deepak Chopra. You, no. When we were sort of concluding our last conversation, you described yourself as a spiritual vagabond and we hadn't really continued that conversation. Um, why do you describe yourself as a spiritual vagabond? Well, I'm a free soul, you know, and i um, very inspired by the poetry of Jalaluddin Rumi, who said, um, uh, it's my destiny to play an infinity of roles, but I'm not the roles I'm playing. In love with life, I live like a gypsy, each day a different house, each day under the stars. In what ways do you feel yourself changed uh, from the, in the time you decided to, to break away from, from, from your traumas, shall I say, of conventional medicine? I look at myself now, uh, besides a vagabond, as a bit of an explorer who's uh, looking at territory um, that is um, very exciting. And uh, it's just like somebody goes to the Arctic and they come back and they have a map. Uh, I go inside to the Arctic as well and I come back with a map and it sometimes people resonate with the map because the territory that it, they explore seems uh, as exciting to them as it is to me when I draw the map. And I'd say my main interest now is in the understanding of the evolution of human consciousness. Um, from time to time people have said that um, human consciousness is capable of evolving to uh, what are called quote-unquote higher states of awareness. It's there in the Upanishads, it's there in the Yoga Vashisht, it's there in the writings, particularly in this century or last century now of Sri Aurobindo, and it's there among some Western uh, philosophers. So for example, Jonas Salk, uh, a pioneer in biology, says that we are in the phase of what he calls metabiological evolution. So my interest now is in what creates intuition, or what is creativity, uh, how does one uh, become a visionary if such a thing is possible, is there something called a sacred response or divine response uh, that the human nervous system is capable of, uh, is there a real entity called God, and if so, uh, how is it relevant to our daily lives. Uh, these are some of the things I'm exploring, but as I do that, I then come across um, uh, what are called anomalies, extrasensory perception, telepathy, uh, remembrance of former lifetimes, uh, prophecy, clairvoyance, uh, all the phenomena that have been considered fringe. And as I begin to look at all of that, I find that actually there's been a lot of scientific uh, interest from time to time. And for the first time, we have now the tools to explore this material, um, you know, because we have a theoretical framework, you know, there's such a thing, again, in quantum physics as non-local reality and the non-local dimension. How, you know, how much of this is, is you know, has been a, a, a personal, um, experiential uh, it's all process been, for it's you? It's all been you know, personal. when we talk about clairvoyance or when we talk about <coughs> past life experiences, uh, are these things that you are experiencing, exploring for yourself? I am exploring them under the general kind of uh, paradigm of what we call non-local effects, which is a physics phenomenon, physics. So, you know, just like you asked me this question about uh, a couple of months ago, I got a call from the producer of ABC um, television in New York, and she said to me, if this is real, we should be able to show it on television. And I said, you know, I'm not yet ready to do that. And she said, well, then it's not real. So anyway, she convinced me to uh, come to Sausalito in California. And I sat down with the science reporter of ABC television. We put him in a room uh, in the building. And he was shielded with nothing. There was no way there was any communication possible with that room. I was in another room. He was being filmed on television. And every time his... Um, his image was flashed on a screen where I was. Uh, I would go into a deep state of meditation, lower my heart rate, lower my pulse, lower the activity of my autonomic nervous system, and then through a certain technique that's in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, I would intend for him to do the same thing. 
and seven out of seven times we scored. Mm -hmm. So it's going to actually be airing this month. Uh, this is what is called non-local effects. Uh, a person from one location can influence the nervous system of another person in another location and now we're going to have it on national television. So here we are. I mean it wasn't my intention to do that but as you know circumstances evolved we did that. So I do explore you, this. You, you, you use the word sort of intend and intend this mm -hmm. uh, and, and in, in, in your writing you've said suggested that if we in, if, if we were to intend that we, we slow or change or stop mm -hmm. the aging process purely the intention uh, would have an effect on our partly, uh, bi partly. biological processes. Partly, because intention, it turns out, is an evolutionary force and it's also a force in nature. Uh, there's something in biology that they call teleology and it was a word first used by a French um, uh, evolutionary biologist around the time of uh, Darwin, his name was Lamarck. And according to the principles of teleology, Evolution is not a random adaptation to environmental forces, but there's intention that uh, perpetuates that creative leap that we call evolution. So according to Lamarckian theories, a camel has a hump because the intention is to walk across the desert and there's no water. A giraffe has a long neck because the intention is to reach up through that tree and eat that leaf. And birds have wings because the intention is to fly. In fact, if you look at the fossil record, there are big evolutionary gaps. So from amphibians to birds, there is no fossil record. And the theory is that was an intentional creative loop, uh, leap, uh, an intentional creative leap in evolution. From primates to humans, there is no fossil record. So yes, I, I look at intention as opposed to desire, by the way. Desire is, uh, is, uh, is grasping and clinging and attachment. Intention is almost like um, yoga guru karmani in the Gita, you know, have the intention and the action, but at the same time have your consciousness established in being. So uh, there's a part of you that's infinitely silent, and there's a part of you that's intending, but the details are kind of left uh, up to the universal mind. What are the techniques that, that, that one might use uh, to, to experience this change uh, in intention? You know, our, our minds are, are, are sort of in, in, in grooves and, and we have sort of <coughs> habitual forms of thinking. Um, uh, surely it requires something more than, than simply the awareness of an alternative uh, for that to happen. Actually the most precise text on this uh, is something that was written a long time ago in antiquity in India and it's known as the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. And if you read the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali there is a section there called the Siddhis and see he's the word actually means extraordinary abilities and he talks about clairvoyance and prophecy and the whole bit you know extrasensory perception telepathy etc and the technique that he prescribes he says is a combination which is basically it is the combination of what he calls dhyana dharna and samadhi so samadhi is to go to that place where observer and process of observation and observed are one and there's stillness there's no movement of thought Dhyana is the process itself that takes you to that place, which is meditation. And dharna is to have the intention from that, a certain quality of uh, single-pointed intention. And actually, that's the way, you know, yogis are able to lower their blood pressure, alter their heart rate, influence their autonomic nervous system, change their body temperature. It's all dhyana, dharna, samadhi. And I think what we are doing right now is putting that in a contemporary framework, in a contemporary language. But the techniques haven't changed in millennia. But that sort of was circumscribed by, uh, in, in, or, or at least our perception is that that was circumscribed by a, a process of extreme, enormous discipline uh, and, and, and almost a, a sense of denial. And, and, and yet you have a philosophy that, that promotes, preaches uh, a feeling of abundance. Uh, I think that the denial is more in the people who uh, interpreted the work and body of this knowledge, uh, whether it be Patanjali or in fact uh, Vedanta as a whole. If you go back to the origins of it, they say the four goals of life are Artha, Kama, Dharma and Moksha. So it's almost like Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You have Artha, which is material abundance, 
Kama, which is sensory and even sexual gratification. Dharma, which is our unique relationship to the web of life and the ecosystem. It's actually an ecological concept, uh, the biosphere. And what's my relationship to this web of life, the ex ever expanding um, relationship of sentient beings. And finally, moksha, which is freedom from uh, psychological conditioning. I mean, that's what really moksha is. It's freedom from the habitual patterns of thinking. So I think uh, originally the philosophy is very complete. Now, when what happens with any body of work is, uh, particularly if it's ancient, it's interpreted by various interpreters and they put their own bias on it. How do you sort of relate a philosophy uh, uh, striving for abundance uh, with inequity, uh, with the limitations of what Mother Earth can, can, can support? Uh, isn't there at some point uh, going to have to be uh, something that restrains us from giving expression to this. You know, look at the sources of material abundance or wealth through the ages. The sources of wealth, as, and you know, wealth always, by the way, precedes power. So, you know, you have economic um, freedom and then you have power. It's the way of life, if you will. Uh, if you look at the sources of wealth and power, as hunter-gatherers, it was weapons of destruction. And the hunter-gatherer nations, even today, derive their power, the predatory nations, whether it's the United Nation, uh, States or it's you know, all these countries that make weapons of mass destruction, they're still doing it. They're still, in a sense, in the hunter-gatherer age. In the age of agriculture, uh, the sources of wealth were um, animal, pro animal husbandry, agricultural products. If you read the hymns of the Rig Veda, it's all about cows, male progeny, and abundance from uh, grain. Uh, same thing in the Old Testament. In the age of industry, the sources of wealth became uh, natural minerals and things we needed to make machines. And so the uh, systematic pillage of the earth began. Now we are in an interesting time. We, the sources of wealth have become information technology. And information technology is an amazing thing because in a sense, it's leading us to the climactic overthrow of the superstition of materialism. What is information? A little bit of data on a microchip, which is a piece of dust. And uh, those who have it are becoming the wealthier nations of the world. And India is now is poised to become an economic power because the rest of the world is recognizing its ability to capture this technology. I believe that the information age is going to be the prelude to um, the age of um, awareness in the sense of a knowledge-based society. It's not just information, but knowledge which is contextual, which is relational, which is holistic. And once we move from the knowledge-based society to a wisdom-based society, which is knowledge which also takes care of the ecosystem with the, of the biosphere, we will have arrived home. Till then, we have problems. I agree with you. Uh, you have, um, uh, you know, your most recent book is, is you know, how, is, is, uh, how to Know God. Um, why is it important that we should know God? Well, ever since we've been on this planet as a human species, we've asked ourselves uh, the question, where did I come from? Uh, what am I doing here? Is there any meaning or purpose to my existence? Uh, what happens to me after I die? Do I have a soul? And does God exist? And if God exists, then does he or she or it care about me? These are very, very fundamental existential dilemmas that human beings have had. Well, does God exist for you? Yes. In what form? Uh, well, that's the point. In no form whatsoever. The God is the ultimate source of information, energy, matter, the fabric of space-time. God is infinite intelligence, infinite creativity, infinite organizing power, infinite correlation, um, infinite love, infinite compassion, um, the source of healing, the source of uh, the removal of our fear of mortality, because God is a domain of awareness which is immortal and acausal and unbounded and is eternal. Is there a distinction between knowing God and believing in God, what is it? I believe, it's a silly way to answer your question actually, I shouldn't say I believe. I think that uh, if something is real, you shouldn't have to believe in it. 
uh, after all, I don't have to believe in gravity to experience gravity. I don't have to believe in electricity to see a light bulb. So if God is real, then uh, God should be experiential uh, and like any other force in nature. And if God is not real, then no amount of belief will ultimately give me the security of uh, knowing that there is God. So knowledge always is more, knowledge and experience are more important. And that's actually very close to what Vedanta says. Vedanta looks at the exploring of divinity as a scientific experiment. These are the rules, these are the techniques, this is the methodology, this is the protocol, and these are the results. Uh, and I'm publishing them for your sake. And my peers, if you try the same protocol, you might get the same results. That's it. But you know, the, 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 the Vedanta has, has, has many schools. It, mm. it also has a school of uh, non-duality. Absolutely. Where there isn't really the difference between you and, and God. So there isn't anything it's to really... It's the school I, I write about in my book is based on the school of non-duality, mm. yes. So what are the sort of techniques that, that, that you're talking about? It's a whole book, but give us a few. How, to, how, how can we know? Well, that? in the book I trace the evolution of seven human biological responses. Mm -hmm. The first is the fight-flight response, which is the response we have in a threatening situation. We either run or we fight. It goes back to our predatory times in the jungle. The second is the reactive response, which is an ego-based response, which says, I'm going to win at all costs. And uh, I start to identify with a moment-by-moment -moment fabrication, my self-image or whatever. And these two responses, have the fight-flight and ego-based responses, have dominated uh, the world culture and have created all the problems that we have now, even though in the beginning there were survival responses. The third response is the restful awareness response, which is samadhi, really, where we go beyond um, uh, cause-effect relationships and actually transcend them to experience a state of inner stillness, uh, no matter what's happening around us. The fourth response is the intuitive response. It's actually to have that ability to stay in that state of awareness and then ask a question and then spontaneously have an answer which is contextual and holistic and nourishing and wise. It doesn't have a Windows orientation. Uh, the f that's the third base, the fourth response, the intuitive response. The fifth response is the creative response. And creativity is a very interesting thing when you start to examine it because creativity is literally, literally a quantum leap in a pattern of thinking. You have a pattern of thinking here and then you suddenly have a new pattern of thinking which has nothing to do with the old pattern of thinking. Uh, you know, it's uh, like a quantum leap of a subatomic particle that's here and now here and it doesn't go through the space in between. Uh, it's non-algorithmic, it's a discontinuous uh, jump from one location to another location without going through the location in between. And if you look at creativity, it's like that. And then there's a sixth response called the visionary response, which some people have, when they transcend to a state of awareness which is almost archetypical, you know, mythological. They relate to a mythical figure, but the mythical figure is actually a symbol of a state of uh, energy or intelligence or power and suddenly you have, you know, uh, a mythical expression in a human being. You know, Krishna is acting out through this human being or, you know, or Icarus is acting out through the, or Ulysses or whatever. And then beyond that visionary response, which is from an archetype, it's what the Buddhists call some bhogakaya. And then you, if you go beyond that, there's the sacred response, which is that non-dual awareness where the whole universe is experienced as a projection of the self, which is in the yoga vashisht, for example. It's all non-dual. And so these are stages of actually the evolution of our consciousness where we experience different gods. So in the fight-flight response, God is a protector because that's what I need in the fight-flight response. In the reactive response, God is the ultimate control freak because I'm a control freak myself. Mm -hmm. In the restful awareness response, the God is peace of mind. Mm -hmm. In the intuitive response, God is one who understands, the Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. In the creative response, God becomes for the first time a creator. Mm -hmm. In the visionary response, God is the source of miracles and now we've gone beyond creative leaps into an archetypal projection. So it's all projection and it's our projection.
until you get to the seventh response, which is non-dual, then you realize there is no God other than your own universal domain of awareness. And that's all there is. And now physicists explain that as the collapse of a non-dual uh, consciousness that collapses its, on its own self, its own mathematical wave functions, and in doing so, one undivided consciousness experiences itself as apparently divided into subject and object, into seer and scenery, but it's an artifact. It's a One perceptual of the sort distortion. Of the, great, uh, the great sort of promises and, and, and the hope that your, uh, uh, your work and your, your teaching, if I may call it that, and, and, and has uh, suggests is that somehow this process can be uh, accelerated, is accessible, it's possible. And that, isn't, that it isn't just something sort of remote out there that people in the Himalayas have, 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 have achieved. See, it was. But um, I also believe that the natural process of evolution is that um, uh, sooner or later we're all likely to bump into it sometime, in some lifetime, perhaps. Uh, but now because we have uh, the internet technology and because I can speak to you about it and people can watch us over there, uh, it suddenly starts to accelerate. And once it reaches a critical mass of intentionality, then it starts to become true for almost everyone. And that's also part of you know, the theories of morphogenetic fields that are becoming so popular now. So yes, I believe A, it's natural. B, giving attention accelerates it. C, collective intentionality influences it. Much of your work and, 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 and institutions and, and teaching has been uh, outside India. Uh, have you considered, thought of, is there something on the agenda uh, that we might have a Deepak Chopra Center here in India that, that we could access? I tried to do that in the past and for some reason, because of bureaucratic and political constraints, it didn't work. What I've done on this trip, this recent trip, is I've started something called the Shankaracharya Foundation in honor of Adi Shankara. It's a non-profit institution and I hope to bring a lot of the activity through that here. I've also developed a very close relationship with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. We've started a multimedia enterprise in the United States called My Potential. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's on our faculty, as are a number of luminaries and even Nobel laureates uh, like Oscar Arias from, from uh, Costa Rica on our faculty. And we hope that through media and other educational programs, we will be able to increase our activities in India. Mm -hmm. For someone who's uh, in, in, in this process of uh, striving, you've moved from uh, you know, with, with, with working with, with healing, quantum healing, to a much larger uh, Still uh, agenda uh, for yourself and, and, and reaching out. Uh, do you have a sense of uh, where you might be going? I've never made plans and I, you know, I don't even make plans uh, for tomorrow. But uh, you know, the word healing comes from the word holy. So holy, healing, wholeness, uh, they're all the same thing. And uh, my plans are to continue writing. I just finished How to Know God. I'm now, I don't know if it's going to be my next book, but I'm, I'm writing about death. I'm very inspired by the poetry of Rabindranath Tagore and his, the way he wrote about death. It's obvious that he had an experience of the unknown that is uh, really was known to him, but unknown to most people. And I also heard a very extraordinary story about uh, Tagore uh, in an orphanage uh, in Poland during the Second World War. There was a pediatrician who actually used the poetry of Tagore to help children who were going to concentration camps and the gas chambers to overcome their fear of death. So I'm on, in my mind, I'm in the Tagore project, mm -hmm. looking at um, as death as a creative response of the soul mm -hmm. to a quantum leap to a new location, new body-mind. In other words, a theoretical explanation of the process of reincarnation. Well, that's sort of a lead to our next conversation whenever it, ha whenever it happens. But um, you know, one of the sort of uh, skepticisms that, that, that people have about other people who, who can talk about and, and preach and teach about things is, to what degree do you feel able to, to practice what you preach? I write only about things that I have uh, either experienced completely or partially. And I'm honest in my um, expression of that. I do not write about things that I have not experienced. 
for the last 20 years, I've meditated for three hours a day. I wake up in the morning at four o'clock. I spend two hours in meditation in the morning. I spend an hour in uh, the evening. Uh, every three months, I do a week of silence where I do not communicate with anyone, including a journalist. <laughs> and I don't even read books during that period and do not have access to phones or telephones. And so I have a seven day period where I'm in total silence, usually in the wilderness or, um, or um, some place where I can't be reached and where I do not have access even to a newspaper. And it's, it's what drives me. It's, these are the periods of silence. One week of silence every three months, three hours of meditation. And the rest of it, I'm pretty loose. I'm not a fanatic. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not a fanatic about diet and things like that, although I believe in healthy living. But um, uh, the experience of meditation has really, uh, for the last 25 years, uh, sustained me uh, in a way that I can't even describe. And what about sort of uh, the insights that you, that you write about, the, the, the practices uh, that, that you write about? To what degree do you, do, these, do, these, do you follow these yourself? I do, and I teach these practices. We have workshops at our center. And uh, so I do a one-week course with the practitioners for advanced meditation. And I join them as I teach them. I have a, it's called the Seduction of Spirit, which is a very seductive title. I do a course called Synchro Destiny, which is about uh, uh, causal connections and karmic connections. And as I do these courses with a number of people, we have the opportunity for validating my personal experiences as well. Well, thank you very much and until our next conversation and we'll, we'll yeah. start off with that. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you, Raji. Thank you.